So before we get into today's episode, just a quick announcement. If you want more tool strategies and tips to help you build your team's culture, I've got some great news for you. The Culture Builder Series is back. For those of you who do not know what I'm talking about, I'm referring to a podcast series that I put on pause a few years ago. And in this podcast, I would share short one to three minute daily tips and strategies for coaches on building culture. Well, I am relaunching this series on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Our YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok handle is at TOC Culture. So whichever platform you prefer, just follow at TOC Culture, and you will start getting these Culture Builders tips for coaches, athletes, and sports parents right into your feed. So as a coach, one of my favorite mantras with my athletes was control the controllables, right? My players heard this daily. And yet there were countless times where I failed to heed my own advice. I'd often spend the majority of a timeout or halftime getting on my team about mistakes they made in the past few minutes. I'd often lose my mind over a blown call by a referee. I probably stressed the majority of our off season over which players were not going to come out for the team next season and, um, and who would come out. I'd even get upset frequently angry about our you know poor facilities the lack of budget our program had or the lack of support from administration or parents in the program when i look back on some of my years in coaching i realize i actually spent a lot of time a lot of my time and energy frustrated and angry about what i couldn't control in fact it's a little bit embarrassing just to think about it about how much i would try to control that that was which was well out of my circle of control and oftentimes even out of my circle of influence. Now, if any of these examples I've shared with you today resonate, or maybe you can think of some areas where you are a little bit too focused on what you cannot control or even influence, well, this might be the episode for you because we're going to talk about how you can control your controllables as a leader, do your best to influence what you can influence, and then let go of everything else. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast, the podcast to help you grow as a leader and build a better culture. My name is JP Nurman, and I'm joined by my friends and co-hosts, Nate Sanderson and Betsy Butterick. In addition to this podcast, I am a leadership coach, culture consultant, and author. To learn more about how my business, TOC, can support you and your team, visit TOCculture.com. To learn more about Betsy's work with coaches and teams, go to BetsyButterick.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the TOC newsletter. Every Thursday, you get a short article, the links to the, that week's podcast, and the notes to that episode of the podcast, as well as our Culture Builder of the Week. Subscribe using the link in the description of this episode or simply go to TOCculture.com and click on newsletter. Well, JP and Betsy, for those winter coaches out there, we're starting to get closer to the postseason. And In my own experience here, I'm going to be honest with you. I've run into some frustrations with a few things that are going to affect our team that I have no control over. And I'll be honest with you. Usually I'm a fairly well-adjusted adult. I think my wife might uh, disagree with that at times, but we know over the course of a season that there are lots of things that will happen that are outside of our control that are going to affect our team or our ability to compete in a game, right? We could talk about officials. We could talk about, uh, you know, what your opponents are doing. We could talk about recruiting. We could talk about, you know, what your players are doing on the weekends. Like there's lots of things that are outside of our control that yet affect the things that we care about quite a bit. You know, oftentimes the outcomes of our game. What I have struggled with is letting some of those things go. And in particular, one of the things that's stuck in my craw here is just the postseason seedings by a committee of individuals that haven't watched enough basketball to know who really should have the higher seeds and who shouldn't. And of course, my fairness gene kicks in and I start getting all fired up here about the way that the pairings are drawn and it's going to affect our team. And I have absolutely no control or influence over it whatsoever. And what I've found, JP and Betsy, is that over the last few weeks, as we've gotten closer here to these these rankings and pairings coming out, is that I have spent an inordinate amount of time worrying and being frustrated and ultimately being disappointed with the way things have been drawn. And now realize, looking back, that was a lot of wasted time and wasted energy because it has no effect. All my complaining and grumbling and scheming 
has no effect whatsoever on how things actually turned out. And so I thought maybe I should talk to some experts about how do we deal with the things that we cannot control and yet we care a lot about. And I'm sure in your work with coaches, you have seen this show up as well. So let's start with this. What are ways that you see this show up for some of the coaches that you work with? Yeah, Nate, first of all, um, I feel you. Your feelings are valid. <laughs> I think the the one thing that comes up for me immediately is this, it's really hard. We can know, you know, logically that we need to focus on our controllables or that it benefits us not to waste the energy that you just mentioned. And yet, because these things influence things that really matter to us, it's really hard to do that. And thinking about recent conversations, one thing that coaches don't control, the student athlete surveys and what's put in those surveys. And yet that's absolutely something that influences really important things like their professional livelihood or whether or not they get to continue in a certain school or within their sport. So this is a big deal. Um, how do we learn to work with that which we don't control in a way that allows us to get back to taking action on the things that we can control or influence? Yeah, I think another area that we see a lot of frustration around things that we can't control is just with leadership. You know, I mean, obviously, with the election cycle coming up, there's a lots of people focused on, you know, who's going to be you know, the, new, the new president. And that's that's a very triggering thing. But I think it's just even for us as coach, as uh, coaches, our administrators, the decisions they're making that impact us are really things that become triggering for us. And how do we navigate and manage those? And for me and my work with coaches, you know, it's it's difficult sometimes too. I want to I want to sit there and vent with them when I hear some about some of these, you know, knuckle brain decisions that people are making at times. You that that are really impacting uh, a coach's livelihood. So it can be very triggering. But I think there's a lot of frustration definitely around the decisions that other people make in their roles and their jobs. Well, let me ask you this question: When you encounter a client or a coach that is clearly I don't know if distracted is the right word, but maybe consumed by um, ranting and raving about things that clearly from the outside, you can see it's just not under their control. And it seems like a waste of energy. Like there's a certain part of it where that's part of our processing. That's how we deal with things. Right. But there's also the, there can be negative behaviors that follow that when coaches really don't deal with it or learn to process it in a healthy way. So when you see that, what are some of the detrimental things that can follow when coaches just can't seem to let go of some of those things they can't control. Yeah. To the two big ones, I would say for me that I see here is one is anger is we have this frust we're frustrated by our circumstances. For me as a coach that always showed up with the referees, I would get angry and hot and man, I did some really embarrassing things in my time as a coach, you know, um, might have once, you know, said some things to referee in a parking lot after the game and, you know, had been brought in the next day by administration because uh, there have been complaints filed against me, right? It's just, there's that anger and frustration that we experience um, that can cause us to do some pretty embarrassing things. I think probably the one thing that I think that really makes us ineffective as a leader, it really steals our joy. It really steals fulfillment of the job as though, is that when there's things outside of our control, it pulls us away from being present. We're caught up in the past we're caught, or we're caught up in the future, right? Like even in your situation with rankings, it's like this this isn't even right now. Like the team that you have and you're coaching right now today, what do they need? You, well, your energy and focus might be on something that's going to come up two weeks from now. Or a coach gives so much energy to something that someone says a week ago or decision an administration made, you know, there's something in the past. And so it pulls us out of the present moment and and that really hurts our ability to be effective in relationships, conversations with people, as well as dealing with difficult decisions and complexity, right? You know, leadership, culture, it's so complex. How do we manage these types of things? If we're still caught up on the last play, right? Or then, you know, the next game and not in the current game, right? It's really going to hurt us. And JP, you mentioned two things. And, and so I'll add two more that I see as detrimental behaviors. When we get caught up in those little things, sometimes that can prevent us from addressing a bigger issue. So it's like that, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. Like we've gotten these little cuts so many times and now we're gonna hyper-focus on this one small thing and 
focusing all of our, our energy, or you mentioned anger, JP, rage, whatever it happens to be on this one small thing actually keeps us from maybe taking a harder look at, at a deeper issue or um, something that might be more important and, and solve many of those small things if we were only able to see it. The other thing is when we lack the uh, ability to control our controllables, to accept that which we can't control, it also makes it more challenging for our student athletes. Because if we're not modeling the kind of behavior that allows them to make better choices when they face something that, that they don't control, that's going to be harder for them to, to come alongside and, and practice that as well. So for me, detrimental is first, it prevents us from looking for bigger issues. And then second, it sets a poor example for how we would ideally want our, our athletes to respond to situations outside of their control. So Betsy, use that word accept, to accept the things that we cannot control. And I think sometimes as we're going through our seasons and, you know, sometimes we just react emotionally, right, to circumstances without necessarily examining them to, to recognize, did I have a role in this? Did I have influence over how this thing turned out? Or was this something where, quite literally, I am, you know, the victim of circumstances that are beyond my control? How, how do we tease through that? How do we look back and reflect on, you know, one, our emotional state, and two, to try to really be able to recognize, you know, was there something there that was under my control that I botched? And that happens to me all the time. Or was there something that happened there that affected our outcome that I just have to accept and I haven't or I didn't? How do we walk through that? Yeah, great question. And I think if we had, you know, the quick answer, we would not be doing this podcast because we'd be retired on a beach somewhere. Um, when you talk about acceptance, one of the the things that I often hear people miss is an opportunity to recognize that just because you accept something doesn't mean you agree with it. You can accept something and still have the feelings and emotions that you have about not liking that situation. So to accept, and what does it mean? What does it look like to accept something that is or that's happened, especially when it wasn't what you wanted or wouldn't have chosen? So I think teasing that apart first of like, okay, can I accept that this is, that this has happened, separate from how I feel about the fact that it exists or it has happened? And then from there, processing emotion. Some people process by venting. And sometimes when I'm listening to a coach vent, I'll give them that space because I recognize, okay, this is part of their process. And then also at some point I feel responsible to ask them a question, which for me shows up as how long do you want to hold on to this? And you'll get a variety of responses. Some people will laugh and be like, I know, I know. And it's like, oh, tell me what you know. Like, I know this doesn't do any good, but it's like, okay, we start by looking at that. Like, let, I'm going to meet them where they are. We're going to process to the point that maybe they inch a little bit closer to acceptance even though they definitely don't agree. But when I give them that question, how long do you want to hold on to this? They start to recognize that, that maybe there's an element of choice here. I don't control what's hard to accept. I do control my response or what happens next. And then we can get into some of those questions you mentioned, Nate, about, you know, let's reflect on this. Like, how did we get here? And where do you want to go from here? So even within this big thing that you don't control, that's hard to accept, is there something small that you can influence or control that might get you either a better outcome in the future or prevent this from showing up in the same way in a, a future circumstance? Yeah, and there's a question in this that I think Betsy has kind of inspired in me, which you know, I'd even ask you, you, Nate, in this situation or the rankings, which is what if you knew there was nothing that you could do that would ever change this situation? How would that knowledge impact you? How would that change things for you? And I think that's a question to, for us to ask ourselves, hey, what if I knew there's nothing I could do that could actually change the outcome? How would that change things for me? And I think it gets us to reflect on a place of just of accepting, okay, how would I move forward? Would I quit coaching? <laughs> would I give up? Would I, would I throw in the towel? No, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably keep coaching. And I would keep coaching how? How would I show up in that? JP, I think in a lot of ways, that's where we start, right? Is that for us anyway, that examination of like, we truly don't have any control over this, you know, so we can be frustrated, we can be angry, we can vent about it. But in a lot of ways, that's just coping with the thing that we recognize we don't control, you know, and 
in better years or better days, sometimes I get through that in a short amount of time or, you know, a, a complaining session with my assistant coaches and we come out of the room and we're moving on, you know, and other times it's an ongoing conversation as, you know, throughout the season that is more distracting than it probably should be. And I think there's another thing that coaches do, and I've certainly been victim of this as well, um, is that, okay, we look at that and we say, we can't control X, Y, or Z, and it's going to have an effect on what happens to us potentially. So I ask myself, well, what do I control that can have some influence on this situation? And while that also seems like a healthy approach to be able to target the things that we can affect in some way, sometimes that can lead us astray too. You know, as I'm thinking about our regional semifinal game coming up here in a couple of days, I'm partly ashamed to say that I've watched 12 games in the last three days on our opponent to make sure that we don't miss anything. I have no idea what my kids have worn, you know, to school the last four days. No clue whatsoever, right? So, like, we can still even over, you know, be, give too much attention to things that we control. And I think that can be an issue for coaches as well. Yeah, the film thing is definitely an area where people grasp, okay, I don't have control over this situation. So I'm going to go spend as much time on here where watching film gives me this sense of control. And we know at a certain point, there's really not that much benefit um, to, you know, whether it's two hours or four hours or 10 hours, but some point watching film is actually doing us more of a disservice than, than actually as a, of a, a service. Well, JP, I want to follow up on that idea of obsessing over film when it, again, there's just a line of diminishing returns when you get past the sixth game, the seventh game, the eighth game, right? And maybe it makes us feel better that we've done everything we could possibly do. That's another phrase that sometimes coaches will, you know, use to, I think, just make us feel like we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, you know, that we possibly could. But yet, just because something is controllable doesn't necessarily mean that it it matters or that it's going to produce a return that's worthwhile. And I don't know if you've got, you know, a way that you help coaches try to see and take a look at that to-do list of, well, here's a lot of things that we could do. You know, I think of, I think of ridiculous rules like, you know, if your socks aren't in a certain way or if you're not on the floor at this time or if you don't show up in this manner, you know, with this notebook and this colored pen for film sessions, you know, like we we exercise sort of control, so to speak, in ways over our players. But does it really matter? Like, are we asking ourselves that question enough to be able to identify what of those things that, that we can control should we actually be investing in? How do you help coaches recognize those things? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think there's a, actually a great story I'd share with you is, is working with a coach earlier who had just got his dream head coaching job, high level collegiate job, had been an assistant for over a decade now. And you think this is going to be this magical moment for this coach. And, and it was for maybe like 12 hours. And then he woke up and he's like, oh shit, I have so much I have to start doing. And I'm still even currently an assistant in this other school. And so there's this all this overwhelming of all the things that he has to do, things that are within his control. But the reality is he can't do them all. And we talked through a, a variety of strat strategies. One of them was actually, hey, let's take a, what would actually go in and celebrating this moment actually look like to start off with. Um, because you haven't done that. But then secondly was, all right, what are you going to choose to not do in the next 30 days? Like things that you could do, but you're just going to choose, you know what, that's not going to be of the most important. And just that not do list, like cutting that down, like, or getting that stuff down, I think is really, really important because it's easy to put together a, a to do list of 100 things that we could do to help build this program to win the game on Wednesday. But I think it's oftentimes a little bit more to, uh, valuable to focus on, okay, we could do all this, but what are we going to not do? And, and I think that's that's a key maybe one place to start that resonates with me jp we've been writing in the the newsletter here a little bit about just the rise of our program at mount vernon over the last couple of years and one of the things that i think we've done well is that we've guessed right in some situations where you know as we're growing even just in our systems we watch our offense you know over the course of the season and you have to make decisions about how you're going to invest your time in practice. We turn the ball over. We can't feed the post. You know, we don't move very well. Like you go through all the list of things that need to get better and then trying to figure out what's going to give you the best bang for your buck, recognizing that, you know, if we work on defensive rebounding down here, well, that's 15 minutes that we're not going to work on possessing the basketball on offense. And am I OK with that trade off? But I think that was a really good experience for us trying to just recognize 
what is the benefit of plan A, plan B, plan C, knowing we all have limited resources in terms of our time and energy that we can invest in our improvement. And I think that approach maybe is helpful for coaches when they have this long laundry list of things they can control of what is the cost and what is the benefit and being intentional about making those decisions. JP, I love that to don't list, right? Like here's all the things you you can do and all the things that need to be done. And what are you not going to do? And how do you be intentional about that? All of this sounds great. And what I hear from coaches often is, okay, Betsy, I get it. Like I get that I should only focus on my controllables for my own benefit, for the benefit of my team, especially where we are at this point in the season. And how do I do that? Like, where do I start? And how do I develop the awareness to be able to recognize in the moment where maybe I'm disproportionately focused on something outside of my control and it would serve me and my team much better to come back. Using that to don't list and and looking at the things that you're currently doing, maybe what's serving you, not serving you in the way that you were just talking about, Nate, and also listening to the people around you. When you hear things like, wow, that was really out of pocket or that seemed unfair, Sometimes that action, let's say making a player run for something where, yeah, that was a small thing and maybe a disproportionate response because you're frustrated that you don't control this other bigger thing and it's really eating away with you. So looking at what are you currently doing, what makes sense and is supportive of the goals that you have either individually or collectively, what's on the fringe and what's that about? So really getting curious about what you're doing that maybe doesn't add immediate value in the pursuit of a certain goal, and then starting to to shift that or change that in a way that is very intentional of, okay, I'm not going to do this thing. Instead, I'm going to you know focus on this pursuit. Betsy, I think that's an important thing for us to be aware of, you know, because when we carry this frustration, uh, ultimately it's it's affecting our fuse, right? Like if I'm going through the day and I'm stewing about X, Y, or Z, and then one of my players shows up 10 minutes late because she had to finish a test that she didn't tell me about. And all of a sudden I jump her case about communication and now she's running extra. And then I go home and, you know, my kids leave their shoes by the door. And next thing you know, my kids are grounded for a week and, you know, like they don't necessarily deserve the reactions that I had or operated from in those moments. But a lot of that, goes all the way back to me just not being able to process or deal with, you know, again, the frustrations that come from, you know, those things. And I think JP, you use some language that I find really interesting that maybe you could unpack a little bit for us here, because you've talked in the past about kind of the sphere of control, the sphere of influence and the sphere of interest. And those are all, I think, different things um, and maybe can help coaches to process a little bit uh, as well. Yeah, I, I think, when I'm working with athletes and coaches, one of the things that we like to look at is what's in our sphere of interest, what's in our sphere of influence, what's in our sphere of control, and where are we putting our energy? Where is our focus? And you know, one thing for an athlete's thing that we often mention is just like playing time. That's not something that's actually within your control, right? It's something within in your influence. So there's there's language like that that helps athletes to better understand so that they can be more accepting of the outcomes, right? Because if I feel like I am in control of playing time, but I'm really not, then when I don't get the outcomes, then there's some real frustration there, okay? So I think when it comes to us as leaders, I think we spend way too much time in the sphere of interest and way too much time in the sphere of control. What do I mean by that? Well, I, I think in a great analogy of, is this. I obviously have interest in the world, world politics, how things are going in wars, elections. Like I, I care about those things. But what I found is the more energy and attention I give, like paying and reading the news, like paying pay attention there, it doesn't serve me, right? It creates actual a lot of frustration and anger, right? And it's not something I feel like I can have any control over or influence, right? And so I've, have I done? I just stopped giving the news really my attention, right? My wife tells me what I need to know and I move through life that way, right? And some people might say that's, well, that's ignorance. I mean, you need to be more attentive, JP. And there's probably an argument to be made there, but I've recognized I really want to take my energy and I want to put it in places that I can have an impact, you know, some sort of control or influence. I think when you go and you see leaders, it's the same thing, right? We can be caught up in the you know, ruminating over the, the rankings or the different situations with um that in our context, 
our lack of facilities at our school, our lack of budget, all these types of things that really piss coaches off, right? And we're just wasting energy and time. But then we flip it. And all of a sudden we go over here and now we're, we, we can be very controlling as coaches. We like you said, the film, I think, you know, even Betsy alluded to some of this controlling behaviors as coaches. We, and I think when we are trying to be controlling as a leader, we often resort to more, more transactional types of coaching, right? To try to control people, to control the outcomes, right? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be controlling certain things or environment, but I think we have a tendency to sometimes lean a little too hard into those controlling things. And so, and we've talked about this back in December, Nate, around the, or maybe it was November in the podcast around the mind trap of control, but really we want to see ourselves as influencers or condition creators. So it comes back to that question Jennifer Garvey Berger asked, which is, what can I do? What are the conditions that I can create for good things to happen? And I think that's so much about leadership is in where can we have influence? Where can we help to nudge, to guide, you know, our team to be successful for our, them to become, you know, good leaders. If we have issues with our staff, right? Like, well, what can we do to encourage them, right? And influence them to take more ownership, to help out more, right? to lead in a more effective manner. So I think for us, we really need to be focusing more where we have influence and, and trying to maybe shape the conditions around our environment for good things to happen. Yeah, I, I love that, JP. And, and I'm learning in real time as you're talking about those three options. And for me, the conversation continues, especially with student athletes, also with coaches though, of, okay, what are your choices? If we're gonna create awareness, then we realize we're having this, you know, expenditure of energy that maybe doesn't serve us. Okay, what choices do you have? You didn't choose or can't control this certain thing. What's available to you now? And then from those choices that are available to you, which one do you want to select to create those conditions where good things can happen? I think if that can become our intention or focus, good things are likely going to result, even if they're not exactly the outcomes that we'd hoped for. Well, Betsy, one of the words that you used earlier was our reaction to things that we may not be able to control or maybe under our influence. And I think that's that's one question that we've used with officiating to help our team this year and in the past years is, look, when we see a crew that maybe isn't going to be great, that's going to do our game, you know, the question becomes, well, then what should we do? We, we can't change it. We're not going to make them better. I'm, you know, me yelling at them is not going to help them out even though I offer to help them as much as they would like, you know, but um, just asking our kids, okay, if this is how the game is going to be called, then what should we do? And I think that helps to get them out of a victim mindset and start thinking about, okay, what is, what is appropriate for us given the circumstances and what should we do next? Yeah, Nate, that, that preparation is key, right? Like, okay, we don't control this. And I, I love that you offer to help the officials as often as, you know, they'll let you, um, that preparation is key. And I think what becomes frustrating or challenging for coaches with student athletes, but also in some of the work that I get to do with coaches is when you meet an individual that sees, seems to be more committed to playing the victim or to victimhood, to blaming other situations, people, circumstances for the way that things are unfolding for them, then they seem interested in taking control or taking action. And that can be very frustrating. It's like, hey, you're, you're the only person that could do something about this. Why are you resisting? For me, anytime I see or hear that resistance, especially when it is a, a repeated behavioral pattern for an individual, my curiosity spikes of, okay, what's true for that person in their past? And what I've learned over time, whether it's a student athlete or a coach, is oftentimes the people that are most resistant to actually taking control, to having influence or exerting it on the things that they could is because that victimhood is a, a coping mechanism for things that happened earlier in life. And not to go down the whole you know, child psychologist path, but just recognizing that for some individuals, especially when they were young, they were in a certain environment, whether it was familial or other, where they did not have a lot of choice. They also didn't have a lot of tools. And so their passiveness, their, their playing the victim that we see it as now, was actually their only way that they felt at the time of staying safe, of not disrupting whatever their context was enough that they then had to experience the consequences of it. So this, this learned helplessness can show up in our student athletes, in coaches, in adults, because of things that we might not be aware of that happened in their past. 
So starting to dig into, okay, what's going on for this person? Like, why are they so entrenched or committed to focusing on the things outside of their control instead of actually taking action on the things that they can control? Once we start to understand where that resistance is coming from or what it's about in part, now we can start to work on generating awareness, whether it's making them aware of some of the choices that they have or giving them some tools that are going to be supportive. So when something shows up and it's not ideal, now they're better equipped to take action in a way that might generate a better outcome or result. Now I look at back on my own coaching journey on this and this idea around control and we have in, or not feeling like we're in control, that victimhood, uh, victim mentality, like I've been guilty of this. And what you just shared there, Betsy, I think is really profound because there's so much of our, to make these changes ourselves. we have to do a little bit of inner work. We do have to do some deep diving occasionally to say, hey, really, what's going on for me here? And, you know, for me, you know, things that I talk about on this podcast plenty of times around meditation, mindfulness, even going to uh, therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy has helped me to develop certain skills to become more aware of when I'm falling back into these patterns of thinking that are not serving me and the people around me. And the most beautiful thing about this for myself and so for so many other coaches that I know and I've had the privilege of working with is that when they start to do this work and their players are able not not to always necessarily to witness perfection, you know, this uh, infallible coach that never makes a mistake or gets a little frustrated with referees or the rankings or, you know, the, the, the leaky roof at the facilities that the administration won't pay to fix. It's, it's not that it's, they, they get to witness front in some way, our own growth, our own investment and, and working on ourselves to overcome some of these things and modeling that growth is huge as well as modeling for them how to respond. And if we can do that, I think it's honestly one of the most transformational things that we can offer our, our young players, our, our athletes. I, I don't think there's a lot of athlete, or, uh, adults doing that for them in today's world. And so I think it really comes down to us to make sure we have, we're making progress in there, this area before we really start to focus a lot on, you know, lecturing our players or working with them on this, right? Once we've done this work, I think we're able to do this and help support this type of work for our athletes as well. Well, JP, as we wrap up here this week, you know, you bring to mind a story um, from a couple of years ago. We were doing our mental health days on Wednesdays during the season, and we were talking about mistake response, and we used um, a scene from The Green Mile. If you remember this movie when uh, the big fellow's on death row and he, you know, takes a, the disease out of the guy and, and he breathes these little fireflies like right into the you know atmosphere and they kind of dissolve or whatever. And we use that imagery to talk to our players about their breath and how taking a deep breath and just sort of imagining, exhaling all these things that are frustrating or disappointing or that we can't control into the air and just letting them sort of dissolve and then moving on to the next scene. And I remember that season, we had a game on the road and we came in at halftime just a, a horrendously officiated game. Our parents are in the stands. They're going berserk. Both sides are upset, you know, but we were kind of getting the short end of it and trailing at half because of it. And our assistant coaches were upset. The players were frustrated. I was frustrated. And we're coming into the locker room trying to figure out a way forward here. And, you know, I started with a 40-second rant on the officiating that it shouldn't be called this way and I can't believe this. And then I just stopped and took a deep breath and this audible sigh, you know, and it was like, it was like that breath that we had talked about on our, in our Wednesday meeting. And I just said, but we can't control any of that. So here's what we need to do. And in the moment, the room changed, you know, and I think them seeing me as a human being here, carrying the same frustration that they were, but also modeling what you talked about right there of there is a way where we get to choose how we influence what happens next, what we control moving forward, starting with our reaction to those things that are frustrating that we can't control. And it's a Hollywood ending. We came back and we won the game and it became a really valuable lesson for our team, not so much in the second half adjustments, but what we learned about our breath and taking that moment that we need to exhale that frustration so that we can serve those around us better. And if there's 
anything that coaches take away from the conversation here today, maybe that's the place to start is that sense of awareness, being able to look at myself a little bit differently in terms of how I'm reacting to some of those things, perhaps jotting a few things down and then coming up with what's, what is my in time, real time reaction to help get me back to a place where I can serve those around me rather than complaining about the things that I have no control over. All right, that's it for today's episode. Hopefully you are inspired and encouraged to focus more on what is in your sphere of control and influence, and then to be an example for your athletes by letting go of everything else. I appreciate you listening in to the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. And also check us out on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at TOC Culture. You'll be getting those practical tools and tips through our Culture Builder series there.